probably a drift there a little bit. Just, uh, all over the place. I was um, working hard not to think that I was in a school assembly set up here. Oh, no, I've come to your pretty seaside town and broken your microphone. <laughs> Is that, is that what can you hear us? Yeah. Uh, well, I think everyone recognises, because everybody who's spoken here already has illustrated it, is that there is, uh, there's no shortage of campaigns and people that are opposed to what the government is about so far. There's no shortage of that at all. Because from the, the moment that the government arrived, from the moment it started, it had this agenda, as Caroline and others have said, it was an agenda that suits its purposes, the purposes of the people it represents. An agenda, first of all, they said it's the debt, our, our job over the next five years is to get rid of the debt. Debt, debt, debt. And if you remember the first year or so of this government, almost every time they were asked the question about anything at all, they would give you this speech about this extraordinary amount of debt we were in. Never has a society been in so much debt and they would reel out all of these statistics that would blind you to it and you think, what have they just said? And they'd be saying things like, we are now in so much debt that we owe £50 for every insect in Britain. And if the, if the deficit was a bee, it could sting the whole of Spain. And you would, and you would think, oh, well, we must be in this enormous amount of debt, I suppose. They keep saying it. And so then they, they gave up on that eventually. And they then said, and this is the agenda that they've got now, is that we have to get the money back. Now this is the, what the government's all about, all the things it does. We've got to get the money back, all this money that we owe. And so where are they going to get it back from? Obvious where they're going to get it, the poor. We're going to get it back from the poor. Because who's got all the money in society? The poor. I, I would imagine that... Uh, to economics A level, the first thing you learn is that the very first rule of economics is that the poor have got more money than the rich. That's mainstream economics now. You can't expect the rich to have to pay the deficit back. They haven't got any. They've got two pennies to rub together. The poor, they spend all day in the stock market, then in the evening they're having to do a second job delivering Domino's pizzas. You can't expect them to pay. It's Polish strawberry pickers. These are the people who've got all the money. They're the ones who caused it. Picking strawberries in the day, I mean, Half an hour's break and destabilising half the world's currency. These are the people, the people at A and E that are in. The, the, these are the people who cause it. We have to shut down accident emergencies because these people in comas, they've been destabilised. <laughs> and so on and so on it goes. And then the poor. If you read, I mean, as I do once a week, I'm lucky because I, I have to write a column every week where I'm sort of given the job of having to try and take the piss out of stupid things that people say. And so I'm very grateful to the Daily Mail that make it very <laughs> put them all in one place. And you will read, if you read the Daily Mail, as I'm sure you all do, every week there will be a story in there that the poor, the poor have created it. Have you read about the woman on a council estate somewhere who's got 185 kids and they're all on benefits? And then she's got a giraffe and now the giraffe's on benefits. And then they complain because the giraffe's getting a crick neck because it hasn't got enough room to stand up straight. So put it up in St Paul's Cathedral and now the kids have said they've got compulsive snooker syndrome so the town will have a snooker table for them and the mother said she can't be referee because she's allergic to white gloves so the mayor has to come round and count all the points otherwise you'll be put in jail by Europe that's what's happening <laughs> <laughs> later they'll say, oh, it turned out that one's actually true, it's just a dream that the journalist had. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter, that counts. And then the, 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 the people who have got sums of money that are so extraordinarily different from the sums that they are even claiming people at the bottom of society are taking fraudulently. They have so much money, these people at the top of society, you have to read it over and over again to, to think that, that this can be even we're talking about the same currency. The millions and the billions, as people have, have said already, as Caroline mentioned, the billions that are withheld from tax avoidance. They're, what these people did, basically, this is the cause of the crisis. 
They bundled up debt packages. This is what the banks did. People like Fred Goodwin. They got debt packages. They bundled them up pretty fraudulently, gave them credit ratings that said that they were far more secure than they actually were. And they did all of this, even when it was working well for them, for no reason other than for their own personal benefit, so that they could catch more and more of the wealth of society. That's the only reason they did it. And then when it all went wrong and the economy crashed, they carry on getting bonuses as much as they were, while it's the poor who have to pay for it. And some of the sums are extraordinary. Imagine Paulson. Imagine that America, Paulson, one of the key people at the bank, Citibank, various banks, that, called, that, that devised this strategy. When he left the bank to go and work in George W. Bush's government, he took his share uh, values, which were $450 million, $450 million, and luckily, because George, Bush, George W. Bush's father, when he was president, changed the rules, he didn't have to pay a penny's tax on that, because how could he have managed otherwise? <laughs> Four, these are the sums of the top 451 person. And you think, why do you even need, what are you going to do with all that, any normal person would think? If you only got 350 million, would you get home and your wife would go, well, how are we going to live off that? <laughs> I was going to buy the keys to the pyramids. We're going to have to make, make do with the Taj Mahal. How can we live? And the arrogance of it, so astonishing. Though I've just one, got a few quotes, we'll have time for them. Lord Jones, head of the CBI as was, he said that in one year after the crash, when the bonuses went down slightly, there's only one year when they got down slightly, he said complaining that year the bankers received not one jot of praise. <laughs> <laughs> it's so harsh and cruel to them, aren't they? They didn't receive any praise, it's like saying the great train robbers, we moan about the year they did rob the train, but for all the years they didn't rob a train, we gave them not one jot of praise. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, it isn't just that. I'm, uh, I'm short of time, so uh, it isn't just. If we were just to paint the story, and I know nobody here has tried to do this, and I don't think you will, but if we were just to paint the story that we're living in a country where there was just relentless attack upon relentless attack upon the poor, and there was nothing else other than that going on in society, then it would be that would be a very untrue part. Uh, uh, it would be a very true image to convey of the society we live in. Because we also live in a society where people do resist and do fight back and do complain. And there's, there's a number of things about that, I think, that are, that are evident. I mean, first, first of all, just even the bedroom tax, the fact it's called the bedroom tax, mm. they hate that. They didn't want it to be called that. The reason it has to be called that, and the reason that now in local papers across the country there are all sorts of stories about people who are suffering about this and people are starting to be aware of the realities of it, is because people, like the many people in this room, have complained about it and written about it and, and spoken about it and forced that onto the agenda. It's created a world that they did not want. The health service, I know we can complain quite rightly about the creeping privatisation of it, but it is still there, it does still work, it is still extraordinarily more brilliant than if it was the one that they would want. After 30 years of Thatcher and Thatcherite politicians, they have not been able to They try to cut something or privatise something, there's a huge fuss and a march and letters and protests and placards and that annoys them. And it, even to resist and lose is better than to not resist at all. Even Thatcher herself. Herself, when the dear Baroness departed a few weeks ago, there's no doubt that it rocked the, the, the reaction to it, rocked the establishment because the first few hours it looked at me anyway as if the way the media was going to present is they honestly assumed that the whole country would say, Well, agree with her or disagree with her, you have to acknowledge that she was an extraordinary woman who changed the politics and she was a conviction politician and so on. And clearly, that was not the case. <laughs> clearly, it became evident to even the media that the the reason millions of people despised her was not because they disagreed with her, but because she'd ruined their lives, which is very different. In fact, I remember at the time thinking the people I felt sorry for that day were the Jehovah's Witnesses, really, because it must be very confusing for them. They'd have been knocking on doors saying, have you heard the good news? And people going, oh, <laughs> of our side, there is still a tremendous strength
that millions and millions of people despise the selfishness <laughs> that goes on at the top of society, that despises a government made up mostly of millionaires born into this vast pit of unearned wealth, saying to the poorest people in society that you're the people who have got to pay for the crisis made by their friends. There is millions of people who dislike that, who are uneasy about that. The trouble is we haven't been organised, we haven't been together. There are loads of different campaigns, they've been disparate and it would be so much more brilliant to have something like the People's Assembly, something like what the People's Assembly is trying to create. A network across the country that means that when people demonstrate against the, uh, the, this new accountant being brought down to look after, if that's the word, uh, the hospital in Brighton, that they're connected to the people who've demonstrated against the closure of the hospital by the same bloke in Lewisham and so on. That, these, that the strikes that go on are connected across the country. And that does mean, I think, that we're going to have to, just two things, two things I'll finish on. We do have to recognise, I think, that this is going to, we're going, if we're going to be successful, it's going to be a new sort of campaign, a new sort of movement, a movement that I think looks like it is going to, to attract people because it is going to unite people across very different sorts of ideas. You can be a, a, an activist in the People's Assembly. If you are in any party or no party, you can support the Labour Party or the Green Party or not support them. That doesn't matter if you are against the terrible injustices and inequality that is being dished out daily by the people at the top of society, then that is sufficient. We have to recognise, after all, I'm sure many of us uh, here have been in parties of the left in the past, that if we're to be ruthlessly harsh, didn't all turn out as well as people might have hoped. <laughs> for a series of magnificently exotic reasons. <laughs> but we're going to have to learn to listen to each other, we're going to have to learn to accept that yeah, we might support an idea like a 24-hour general strike, that's fine, we can argue for that, but if people don't feel that that's the way we want to go forward, then that's fine. We don't want to make people feel unwelcome because they don't agree with that. And finally, I'll just say this, which is that... the. There is a sort of consensus usually amongst people that write in newspapers and so on that we have to, you, you can't get anywhere unless you occupy the centre ground in politics. And that may or may not be true, but what it leaves out is that the centre ground shifts, it changes, and it changes because people make it change. Just one example, the issue of gay weddings. Now if you were in favour of gay marriage 20 years ago, you were an extremist. Now you're an extremist if you're against that. And that's not because it's just magically shifted. It's shifted because millions of people, often in the most unlikely and difficult circumstances, have made it their business to argue and fight and campaign for an idea. and now seems ridiculous to oppose. And so it is with so many other ideas as well. And they try to present a consensus that, of course, we have to accept there is this massive deficit and we've got to cut benefits and the poor have got to accept their housing benefits have got to be cut and all that sort of thing as if there's a consensus. But there isn't a consensus. And we can, and I think that several thousands of people, that's not a sort of magically lefty, sort of trumped up number, there's several thousands of people already who have come to the meetings and have pledged support for the People's Assembly, I think is the beginning of a movement that can attract a vast number of people, that can do whatever it is, people whatever they can, be aware that whatever you do, something is better than nothing. If you can go on a demonstration or organise a meeting, fine, if all you want to do is write a letter complaining to the local paper, that is better than nothing. An army of people, under whatever uh, name we call it, let's say it's the People's Assembly, that across the country brings together all those people and presents a different sets of ideas can, I believe, completely shift the middle ground so that they appear to be the extremists because surely the most extremist idea you can have is that the poor and the people in society who have to pay for the mess created by the filthy vermin at the top of the